Okay, welcome back to those of you who may be viewing. We had a program with our guest uh, that aired yesterday. That would have been the uh, 5th of February, this being the 6th. We have another continuing conversation with a young man who I think is marked for importance in our society on a world scale, an, in an intellectual scholar and a person who's very concerned with the human condition. That's Bakari Page, and he's our guest. We closed out last week having the far with a with a chart the Buckminster Fuller, a person he admires, uh, stating that uh, we may have transcended material scarcity uh, at this moment, uh, this general moment in history, uh, in terms of our capability technologically of providing life support with ecological concern, and whether or not uh, that was something that appeal we were talking to that. And I wonder, um, what do you think of that general proposition, if I may, as a question? And then also, I know you're very connected with the Zeitgeist movement. Uh, great numbers of variegated thinking. In fact, it represents the world. There's a great deal of variegated thinking. Um, is it possible, particularly since you've written a book, or you're in the writing. process of writing a book, Yeah, uh, enough for all, forever, seems to have remnant or, or, or redolent, redolent to the idea of transcending, possibly transcending material scarcity as a thing that could be developing in the time in which we talk now. And I wonder how those two things fit to you. Think, do you think we may be at a time of qualitative transformation, uh, of transcending perhaps material scarcity as it affects human individuals and also institutional structures, and particularly the design of our economic, political, and social systems for Organize, uh, an operating manual for Spaceship Earth that may be relevant to what the future required and the lack of that is being expressed in Occupy Wall Street and other items of discontent that are so manifest in the world. Do you think we're at time of major qualitative transformation? I think right now, um, I think right now we are dealing with uh, a unique, a unique clash um, mm -hmm. in terms of the financial system is bucking up against the, the uh, is bucking up against its own limits, and then right. on top of it, we're also dealing with a resource, uh, a resource reality, okay. which is that we're now at this place where we have the ability to provide for enough for all forever mm. on the on the entire physical planet. Now, one of the Whereas immediate, we haven't had historically. Well, yeah, exactly. Okay. One of the one of the things that was important about uh, what's important about that is that it's not something that we see. Um, it's not something that we see in the world. It's just something that we sort of know in terms of the scientific reality of it, in terms of what other people who have looked at right. the resources have shown yeah, yeah. and said that, hey, this is something that exists, sort but of. we just haven't really manifested this in our behaviors and in the institutions that have been sprung up from that yeah. condition of scarcity. That was it may a cap be a capability, mm -hmm. but we have a lag mm -hmm. by having reified outdated institutions that mm -hmm. become outdated relative to the future future mm -hmm. because we have our identities wrapped up in institutions that were in one condition mm -hmm. and that condition at the level of capability is a borning. Mm -hmm. So it's latent. Mm -hmm. and it's like latent heat. In yeah. I, I, okay, yeah. Okay, now, huh? dealing, with, dealing with that, there's a, there's a policy c distinction that needs to happen at that point. Yeah. There are, and then there's actually movement that has to happen with, with when, within people. There's got to be a change in the way that people in, interact with right. this new reality. Yeah. But also there needs to be an awareness of that reality. Yeah. There's not an awareness of it. And uh -huh. except for in small Small and and growing institutions, and one of those one of the first institutions that that dis, that discusses this on, yeah. on, a, on a truly global scale, yeah. the Zeitgeist Movement, yeah. an organization that I work for, and um and and that's one of the things that makes it unique is that okay. we're recognizing that scarcity as a reality is not necessarily the viable, um, or it's not really applicable to the current reality. Current, it's not, uh, and particularly to the future. Yeah, of course, and yeah, to right. and the future. Yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. the, and the very field of futurism has been has been talking about this post-industrial trend yeah. that's been exam that's been happening in the developed countries that's right and that's what the what, that's what in the developed countries in the major um, and industrial countries but this is something that also the developing countries the third world countries mm -hmm. are going to be going through themselves this post-industrial trend right. this this movement towards miniaturization of of resources, the miniaturizations of goods and services, and also what Buckminster Fuller would call the formalization of these goods and services, the ability to use 
a resource uh, uh, an expanded way um, use use a resource in the most uh, the, use the most of that resource yeah. um, in the most effective way yeah, so uh, ephemeralization, ephemeralization is doing yeah. more with less doing more with less and it's through good design mm -hmm. and, and the microchip is a great example yeah. of that is it not a mm -hmm. room full of vacuum tubes a factory mm -hmm. it comes down to a thing that's going to go through the bloodstream and be ever more effective mm -hmm. there's lots of examples of doing more with less yeah. through good design mm -hmm. and that applies to ecology mm -hmm. and other issues it seems intractable. Mm -hmm. And that's how this becomes a comprehensive uh, view right, of the world. This right. is how this becomes a comprehensive systems view of the world. Uh -huh. Is when you start to realize that you can do more with less. When you realize that and yeah. you start to apply that to different principles, different design problems that you have inside of the world. This is mm -hmm. something that Russell Ackoff talked about yeah. in terms of his distinction between systems thinking and analytical thinking. Okay. So uh, systems thinking was the idea, was was that was the, uh, systems thinking resulted in synthesis des uh, and design thinking. Yeah. Those were the, these were the ways in which uh, Russell Ackoff defined them. He said analyst was the way that we get to what is oh, this? Uh, no, no, no. Analyst brings us to synthetic, assist, synthetic thinking. Systems thinking brings us to design thinking. Okay. And how do we design a world yeah. that works? Like Buckminster Fuller would say, uh -huh. make a design a world that works for 100% of humanity. Yeah. And that comes from first that recognition of that we have um, we have a world that has transcended scarcity. That's a huge consumption. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference between 200,000 years of uh, essentially scarcity. Again, I, th I mentioned, I think I did, uh, economics is defined as the allocation of scarce mm -hmm. resources. It's assumed. If you say to somebody now walking in the street that we've transcended scarcity, they would say that's ipso facto absurd. Mm -hmm. Of course we don't. Everybody's the, starving. When you think about the history yeah, you know of what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. When you his, when you use the when you think about the history of economics itself, yeah. economic the economic history that that we've absorbed in terms yeah. of the people who, who live Smith, who live in America yeah. who have, on, have gone, undergone because the truth is we've seen other resource-based economies other societies resource that resource-based resource -based economy. economies that's something we want to get to yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. societies that operated with um, this consideration of using their resources to the maximum ability by using the least amount of those things mm -hmm. this is something that many agrarian wage societies operated under okay. um, these are uh, the this, uh, South American societies these are the, um, um, the early African African societies. A lot of these societies that, that had a, a, a resource plenty, uh, plenty in their in their um, in their times in their in their little regions, yeah. so they were able to, to deal with their societies in a much different plenty way. Plenty in terms of a particular aspect of an overall. No, for over from an overall perspective, these yeah. these in these societies, they were not not they were not warring societies. Yeah. Because they had a resource, they, they had, had a enough, resource abundance. Like the, one of the main things you need is food. Don't yeah. You? You and to, they you, had you access to have air. To those you have to have. Uh, and it yeah. was also an yeah. underlying value trend that mm. worked that 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 that's uh, accompanied their their understandings about resources. Right, so yeah. there's some African tribes that talk about uh, the some African proverbs that say, I, I get full when you eat. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. So that's so that's that's a circle of care. You broaden that circle of care. It's no longer just one individual concerned You're talking with about his own Paleolithic self. time. Uh, it, it, um, hunting um, and gathering. Um, um, Marshall Sounds would call it Stone Age economics. Yeah. Okay. These right. Stone Age. But yeah. that but yeah. that that dis that that distinction is not not necessarily accurate. It's also this hard is to know for sure what it was. Ashley Montague writes on that. They think that. Uh, there was a great deal of cooperation mm -hmm. inherent in the by, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by man woman pair mm -hmm. bonding mm -hmm. in order to survive the mm -hmm. species. Yeah, but but when you yeah, look in, when you look projection. into the histories when you yeah. look into the histories of these uh, these earlier societies because that's one, one of the things I was talking about in earlier broadcasts is that yeah. when you talk about when we think about history we're not really looking at uh, a great deal of it we're only looking at a very small bit of history when we're talking about yeah, how it, not even not not ne not merely just the history of the world itself but yeah. also the history of the human species. The human species has been here for two hundred thousand years. Yeah. We didn't really start recording history to to very recently, About and we didn't have the modern years. economic yeah. systems that we have, including Adam Smith, yeah. until very very recently, yeah. Yeah. something like three hundred years ago. Yeah. When Adam Smith, when he codified his concepts mm -hmm. about um, about the way the economic system would work, which yeah. was reinforced by Thomas Malthus and reinforced by David Ricardo, and then reinforced by other thinkers along that lines, which yeah. includes F. A. Hayek and all of these other other economists, yeah. they're all. Their, their roots intellectually come from this place of ex extreme scarcity. Yeah. Not, oh, not, yeah, not, yeah. Not, yeah. not 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 like certain things were, but mm. extreme scarcity. Yeah. Where the populate where 
You're Turn talking 19, this 18th, 19th century Yeah, we're talking Europe. That. And yeah. this is yeah. when the economic yeah. systems, horrible, the yeah. economic systems that we live under mm -hmm. were constructed. Yeah, that's right. So despite the fact that resources now have become to a place where there is uh, enough, and as, as, I, as I explained in my book, enough for all forever, that's the, a huge the, the economic a, history that no, we're living under, yeah. the structures that were built under this economic history, uh -huh. have all assumed that scarcity will be an, an ever-existing right. reality. It's so, still assumed. So if it's still there, yeah. then when you talk to somebody and say, hey, um, we don't live in a, uh, a, 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 a reality of, of scarcity in which yeah. I have to relate to you. This yeah. is, in fact, a... This is a false reality, a matrix, if you want to, and use the. Uh, That's which we've inherited, and, and and because we've inherited, it takes this awareness thing. It takes yeah. this an awareness action, which the Zeitgeist movement is taking yeah. to say to tell people, hey, uh, we we don't live in this, we don't live in this reality of scarcity. Uh -huh. We actually live in a re reality in terms of our capabilities. You would say our capabilities allow us to interact with it with an abundant world in economics if you make a, economics is a thing where like say uh, 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 if you uh, you have a capability uh, you're going to make an let's say you're going to make an investment you're going to make an investment that's going to pay for itself out of its future earnings that's the logic of let's just say generally business finance you're mm -hmm. going to make an investment it will pay for itself out of its future earnings so you're tapped into the future in a sense that's different then when the capital accumulation that makes the investment possible is from past savings only. Mm -hmm. So that's the, you know, they've been able to build that way. And that's the way the investment is done. There's no way in which you can tap into the future earnings in a sociological way where everybody can tap into the logic of we're coming into a future that has got great promise relative to the past. We have no way of having that redound to the interests of the mass of the population do you understand what I mean at a business level? So the way in which we form capital or invest in the future technology is one that leaves out of the uh, equation the people to have the ability to be part of that investment pr procedure. Nobody would be able to grant them credit because they have no past savings to put up as collateral. Can you say, so we need a way in which the population at large can be brought into the future earnings. It'll pay for itself in five or six years normally over the business cycle in a long time, but we don't have any way. That's one major problem about how we're going to form capital in a way and also distribute demand or buying power to the population in order to clear the market. Can any of that make sense to you or is it relevant in terms of making that bridge between the past institutional structure that is being transcended or subsumed some way mm -hmm. because that's most of your political and economic leadership and it's going to be subsumed some way with the, the benefit of the general population and the ecology and the cooperation of all that Buckminster Fuller and other systems thinkers can see. That's a major question, how we're going to do that, is it not? Mm -hmm. Tap into the future, which is more promising than uh, what has been assumed to be out of history. What do you think? Sounds good. No, I mean, does that make sense to you in, in terms of what you're thinking? Because you, enough for all forever is saying in a certain sense the title of your book that you and your colleagues are writing is positing a different world than that which we've inherited mm -hmm. in a qualitatively different way mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. so and um so that that's what i'm thinking and is that uh, what why did you give the title of the book enough for all forever uh did you come up with that at once and mm -hmm. what does it connote and what's it trying to connote? Maybe you could talk about the book a little sure. bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, so um, originally, my my concept for the book was to take this film, That Guy's Moving Forward, which is a film that's got about twenty million views, twenty two million views on YouTube. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of people have watched it. It's about yeah. three. It's about three hours long. Yeah. Um, so three hours long for twenty two million people to watch a movie is, is phenomenal. Basically. Do they watch it all uh, the way through? Of course. That's oh. one of the, it's, it's an incredible a grabber. film. Yeah. Yeah. It's a grabber. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the ideas, one original idea that I was going to take was because I was really concerned with I was really concerned with people asking me 
me questions about this and me not being able to talk about this, uh, talk talk about the yeah. idea of removal of scarcity yeah. and what it means to take a systems approach to the way that the world world works. It's to, huge. To, to, it's a huge issue. Yeah. It's because it's such a comprehensive view. I yeah. wanted to be able to understand it. So originally, when my idea was, I was going to take the film mm -hmm. and I was going to um, source it in terms of all of the research that went into it, all of that. I was working. With, I was going to work with the director and all of that. And um, and uh, when I spoke with the director, we decided that that wasn't probably the best um, the best route for going with okay. that. So um, I still was sitting on this huge pool of research of research that I had done, yeah. along with different people who I had been associated with, people at the University of Toronto, PhD students at the uh, University of Toronto, University of, uh, of Calgary, um, University. Uh, it's, it's a whole bunch of different universities across. Are these across all the, part of the Zeitgeist? Family? All of these, yeah, all of these, okay, all of a, my that's researchers, a growing family. It's all very of the researchers yeah. who are who are involved in my uh, involved in my project are all members of the Zeitgeist. Movement. Okay, we good, all yeah. recognize and accept this 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 reality. No all way to get a me. general. George you know, Washington University as well. These these like. These these are these are strong students. These yeah. are people who have taken the opportunity to really look into this. University of Alberta. A all of them. Number how many there are? Or in any? terms of the members? Yeah, just in general. So too. in 2009, the Zeitgeist Movement membership was something about two, two uh, about 500,000 people. 500,000. That was 500,000 people across yeah. the world. Now and that these was, are all systems thinkers, these, serious scholars. Yeah. So this That's was a very this was 2000. Movement. Yeah. This was 2009. Yeah. Um, the Zeitgeist Movement was founded in 2008. Yeah. Now if in 2011 is when the movie Zeitgeist Moving Forward yeah. comes out, which gets 22 million views. Yeah. And now today, um, all of the films, um, Zeitgeist, Zeitgeist Addendum, Zeitgeist Moving Forward, which are general expressions of Peter Joseph, which are not necessarily directly connected to the Zeitgeist yeah. movement, uh -huh. but are still um, literature that people look to to understand what the, the condition of scarcity that, that they no longer live in is. Um, uh, you want to make a distinction. We live in it in a degree because a lot of our political decisions are made along those lines. Yeah. But we are trying to get to live in something new or borning. Mm -hmm. So it's we don't live in it's a, that that question of the transformation from one condition to another, mm -hmm. particularly one that's include everybody. So you have to include and subsume some of the outdated institutions in a new pattern. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's system thinking, and that's what's called for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, the Zeitgeist movement at that point had about 500,000, that was 2009. Then 2011, a film comes out, uh, the film comes out, which um, increases the membership. So again, we still haven't counted the membership since 2009. And then mm -hmm. in 20, 2012, all of the films are accessible uh -huh. on the popular uh, media films, um, accessible places like Netflix, for instance. So all of these things are membership builder projects that we've done, including um, Zeitgeist Days and Zeitgeist Media Festivals, all of these different things that we've done as an, as a, as an entire movement. And yeah. these are all global, rea all these are global reactions. Yeah, right. So when we, we do things like Zeitgeist Day, which is a worldwide participation thing, where it's an educational platform, it's something that's going to actually happen in March. Our big, um, our, our, our major event is in Los Angeles this year. Um, but when we do in these March. things, yeah, in March. Do you have a definite date? I or? believe it's March 15th. I could be wrong. March you can find 15th. anybody. Don't make it the 17th. Anybody can find out the uh, the information on, uh, on re regarding the Zeitgeist Movement on www.thezeitgeistmovement.com. Spell it. Um, www.thezeitgeistmovement.com. Slow, slow. Z -I -Z -E -I -T -G -E -I -S -T okay. So anybody can find With the information the. there. Huh? With the, the, With the, the. Um, And you can find information about the Zeitgeist Movement there. And now there, there's still that ticker that says how many movement, but these that, that was an outdated, uh, yeah, outdated right. ticker. So it's growing. It's constantly growing. Yeah, good. And and, good. and constantly, w and, w and and that's the real important concept here. Is, okay. Is that information because it's serially because yeah. it serially develops because people need to be able to tap into that group mind. The more people become aware of this reality, I believe it's a uh, there's a distinction where once an idea becomes um, once an idea gets past ten percent of the population, um, once once ten percent of uh, any population understands or accepts the, the the truth of an idea, then it expands to the entire population, uh, and whether it disseminates or gets filtered out or whatever. But that's the idea is that we can get. The concentration of this information, which is very simple, mm. how do we use the scientific method for the social concern, mm. and 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 also how do pe and can people recognize this reality of of the transcendence of scarcity, and that's where the uh, the the sort of theory. Would of the you book say comes that's from. a that's a foundational principle, the transcending of scarcity among the zeitgeist people, um, as a I'm not uh, sure mission what the question statement? Is. No, 
the transcending of scarcity in a yeah. real in a realistic level, whether mm -hmm. it's ontologic or mm -hmm. intellectual or real, mm -hmm. is a major premise of the zeitgeist movement. I would say, I would say that we realize that we have, we realize that if you if if resources are used in an efficient way, okay. if we um, if we apply mm. the methods of science to the way in which we deal with production, the way that we deal with um, distribution of goods and services, mm -hmm. if we figure out how to associate our values to, uh, to, and relate those to what nature tells us about our, about our world, nature, yeah. if, we, if we associate these things, uh -huh. then we can achieve a, uh, a type of abundance, uh -huh. um, a true global abundance yeah, yeah. for the entire human population, which is something that's never been before Including seen. ecology. Yeah, Including of course. Including the ecology. Of course. And, we're and, at the, and the, the idea is... not at the disadvantage of anyone. So that means they're all inclusive mm -hmm. of the human society mm -hmm. as well, including the people mm -hmm. who have a great vested interest in mm -hmm. the outdated institutions to, to be subsumed, mm -hmm. which would be a lot of My, political and economic leadership. The most maybe? important part of that phrase to me, though, is yeah. through spontaneous cooperation. Yeah. There's, there's nothing more important than that. No. It's, we, there's no dictatorial. We've, as, uh, the philosopher Isaac talks about this. He says, um, he says, all of the 20th century alternatives uh -huh. to capitalism, uh -huh. every one of them, uh -huh. failed uh -huh. miserably. Fascism, Nazism, uh, and and socialism, uh, whatever and, and whatever Communism, and whatever yeah. ways it was um, distinct, distinguished, whether yeah. it was Stalinism or whatever, yeah. all of those ended up failing miserably. So the question is, can we move past? Is there a way for us to move past yeah. using the market um, as our means for us to access ex access goods and services yeah. from the from the oh, I guess from the from the from the planet. Yeah. Can we access those things yeah. without turning back into totalitarian places where it's servant dominated um, so, I mean servant servant and master domination kind of thing. How do we move past that and can yeah. we be at a global yeah. circle of care where everyone's concerned? Yeah. And so that's why I say spontaneous cooperation is most important. Yeah. No one needs to be told or forced into whatever position. Uh -huh. But if people come to this knowledge and through their own through their own, you know, do their own uh, uh, education, yeah, yeah education. with investigation, exactly. Yeah. If they come to come to that knowledge and say, yeah. "All right, I agree with this, and I've done the investigations necessary to support this," yeah. then they join the Zeitgeist movement, and we move forward, and yeah. we grow this growing awareness, and more people understanding and accepting this reality. And yeah, using that forward. yeah, yeah. And they and they could be uh, inventing or having institutional structures into which they could fit mm -hmm. and have it grow one for the other. Do you have a term? Um, what is it called? Um, a resource-based economy. Mm -hmm. And that's something that seems to be in, intrinsic to the zeitgeist mm -hmm. thing. What is meant by that in terms, does it tie into Henry George at all, or any of the thinking as to how we're going to form capital, or the, you know, tax structure or mm -hmm. something? Resource-based economy. What is meant by that? Well, there is a bibliography for a resource-based economy, yeah, and it's I not know. very, it's not very, it's not very much talked about, and that's what the purpose of my book is. Mm -hmm. So, anybody out there who's really concerned about this concept of what a resource-based economy mm -hmm. is, once the book comes out, it should be completed by the end of this year. By the I think end of the year. By the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by the end of 20, 2013, people should be able to have this bibliography that I think really informs um, the way Jacques Fresco and how others others who talked about a resource-based economy uh, came about. Understanding. So I, I think there is a measure of, of Georgiaism that was involved. Um, uh -huh. I haven't done enough research into uh, Andrew, Andrew George. George yeah, I yeah. have his book Progress and Poverty. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm He's I'm good. starting to get a you're little a, bit more. You're deeper aware in a little bit of Kelso. Um, yeah, I know about Kel Louis Kelso, Louis Kelso um, the Capitalist Manifesto. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but the but. And the the train the train of thought really begins with Frederick Soddy. Mm -hmm. um, it actually goes a little bit um, a little bit before Frederick Soddy with people like the 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 um, uh, the physiocrats, um, yeah. of some, uh, all of these biophysical economists. A lot of a lot of early people who said that we need to figure out a way to tie our economic process yeah. into into understandings about the sustainable uh, un, into understandings about what sustainability is okay. so that means tying our economic process to ecological principles right, and into thermodynamic principles how do we understand the economy right. through the way that the world actually operates right. as opposed to abstractions through financial financial capital or whatever xyz's yeah. so frederick Soddy in his book called um, wealth virtual wealth and debt i'm not sure when uh, this was this was the early 19th century early 19th this is very early uh, no this is 
is America. This is America. America. Okay, um, so Frederick Seidel, he writes his book and he points out that wealth itself uh -huh. is not something that comes from money. Wealth is actually the capital that the earth actually has, the natural oh. capital. Well, that's and that's what wealth is. Yeah, yeah. And um, that, was, that was Henry George also. He said the, not, the resources should be owned by everybody. Yeah, so that's what the, that's, yeah. um, uh, so that's what I said. I'm not, I have not done enough research yeah, okay, into Henry right. George. I'm, well, you got this is a part of yeah. the process of writing, writing right. a book. Okay, good. Um, so Frederick Saudi took that, took that and ran. And, and when you look into different interviews by Howard Scott, Howard Scott was the, um, was the founder of the technocracy, yeah. technocracy Inc. Right. And, um, uh, uh, which was um, early founded, which which was before it was called technocracy, which was the 1933 mm -hmm. um, d determination of the word uh -huh. um, or co uh, not founding. Uh, what's the word for it? Incorporation, incorporation of the word. Uh -huh. um, it was they were called the technical alliance, yeah, and the yeah, technical remember, alliance yeah, was yeah, yeah. An, was an operation that was where really a lot of these different Columbia um, University professors and a lot of people, uh, friends of Albert Einstein, mm -hmm. a lot of different well well funded and uh, very well versed scientific thinkers yeah. at that time. That's why it's the 1920s. Mm. A lot of these people, and they came to this um, distinction after doing tons of research, tons mm. of surveys, right. tons of literature right. about where did the North American continent working, and not just the North American continent, but really going all the way up to Greenland and all this, all this area. Yeah. They decided that in this particular part of the world, that yeah. there was more than enough resources. Mm. So many resources that are available that it made no sense for a price system where people have to access the market to get capital. They said that there was no reason for that to happen. What, we, what, we, what they felt that there needed to be energy credits. Uh -huh. and, and energy we need to, credits. Energy credits. Yeah. And that because the, the, glo the currency of the world really is in energy, the, yeah. the only true currency that, that, that exists in the world is energy, if yeah. you understand that, or if you accept that premise, yeah. then you build your economic system based on that. Uh -huh. and, now in, and then in 1933, they were discredited by a lot of different me uh, mechanisms. They were very popular in the beginning of the year, and they lost it out by the, by the but they lost the a lot of their of the membership by the end by of the, the year. By the end of the, the year? By yeah. the end of that 1933, 1933. year. 1933. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the middle of, of the Depression. In the middle of the Depression. Yeah. They, but um, a little kid, uh, something like 20 years old about this time, he's living in Brooklyn and he hears about this, uh, he hears about the technocrats. Yeah. He sees the newspaper articles, us and the third, and he, start, he joins up and, it's, and he's the person who ends up 97 today. His name is Jacques Fresco. Yeah, and Jacques yeah. Fresco oh, took really? on the okay. ideas of, tech, of technocracy, but he also incorporated other ideas. He ideas, incorporated yeah. ideas of systems thinking, mm -hmm. which was just slowly becoming much more profound. Again, that Polish fellow. And Alfred Korzymski, yes, Korzymski, absolutely. Korzymski, yeah, he's a good uh -huh. guy. Yeah. Uh, general yeah. semantics yeah. and this was these are things that J um, Jack Fresco studied yeah. while he was trying to understand how do we make the world work for 100 percent of humanity so you had he, other did he people use that language? Uh, I'm not sure if he used that, that particular that's language that's that was good to combine yeah, but the those two, are yeah. but these are these are other people who are thinking like this so yeah. you had Jack Fresco who was thinking mm. about how do we take care of the entire planet and then can we take care of the entire mm. planet book Mr. Fuller doing the same thing yeah. and other people who are associated with the technocrats and other people who are associated with general general semantics yeah. but also you had people who are developing other other forms of science, which yeah. was the cybernetics people like Norbert Weiner. Norbert Weiner in 1948, he, re he releases his book Introduction to Cybernetics, yeah. which ends up becoming the um, ends up developing into the field of. Um, I had of, a friend. I had a friend, uh, Mark Stallman. I don't even know him. He was uh, he he took AOL public when they went public. He had he, he coined the term Cyber Alley, you mm -hmm. know, for here rather than Cyber Valley. And his um, uh, he his dad was in the room with Norbert Wiener. Mm. In 1948, when they coined the term cyber, wow. he yeah. was in the room, about 10 guys, they came up with, it means steersman, right, mm. in Greek. But he, and one of the things that Norbert Wiener came up with was that information overload, which is a term you hear a lot, because we're being inundated with information, particularly multimedia, information, information overload permits pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. So you can see patterns between systems, and that's the basis of thinking about the viability of systems thinking mm -hmm. itself, because you got you can see patterns between all these different uh, d d disciplines and so forth, and that's what's being encouraged in terms of systems thinking. Yeah. But he was very much that way, and it's coming along, it's coming along practically like a snail space, and then it goes hyperbolic, and then it goes exponential, and it's going exponential now, mm -hmm. the cyber stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's a model for the world that has to be taken into account in terms mm -hmm. of communication, certainly. Mm -hmm.
and for the the, the growth of a systems mm -hmm. way of approach. Yeah. So 1948, like you, like yeah, you were talking about, it was, um, yeah. cyber, um, cybernetics is coined. The book is released, and yeah. then so, and then this is how the birthing of informatics and systems thinking yeah. and systems theory comes about. And then you have yeah, that, and all of these people are building, trying to and connecting, and not all of them, but most of them yeah. who are involved with the systems perspective are also incorporating its ecological principles and, and involved so, yeah. in. so you have people natural like Donnell. Natural tie in there you think? Excuse the me? natural tie in with the cybernetics and ecological thinking? I think that there, there, there is a is synergy something. between yeah. those two. So, yeah, you, yeah. so you have people like Donnella Meadows who came out with um, the thinking and systems but also came out with the book Limits of Growth. Yeah. And you have the modern environmental movement building upon and using some of these principles of cybernetics and systems Limits thinking. Limits wasn't that, uh, wasn't that uh, um, Sam, no. Um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, Donella Meadows, the systems thinkers, all of these people are involved with this process of understanding systems thinking. And then in 1970, um, Jacques Fresco comes out with his organization, which is his original organization what year? called NASA's 1970. Okay, and my a, calculus, 1970 is likely to be seen in the history of time into this ever world where there's going to be enough for all forever like mm -hmm. that. I think it's going to be seen as uh, 1970 is going to be seen for reasons I could go into it, but won't, mm -hmm. is the year one. Mm -hmm. There was a qualitative transformation occurring then. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that book came out. A lot of other things happened mm -hmm. in 1970. So but at anyway, that point, Jacques Fresco sci comes out with his organization. It's called Cy Socio Cybernearing, mm -hmm. and trying to understand and, and applying social social um, cybernetic principles uh, to the economic process. Okay. And then he starts doing his city designs and XYZs and XYZs. And later on, he, he develops the concept of a resource-based economy, okay. which is the removal, uh, which is really a global commons, a place mm -hmm. where people can access goods and resources. A way to uh, a good way for people to understand this. Um, this process of a global commons with people being able to access goods and resources without interacting with the market. The great example I like to give, which is 3D printing. So 3D printing is the process in which we create products without, with, uh, we actually create products without having to interact with the market. How do you do that? So a oh, printer, okay, go ahead, yeah. a printer comes out, um, yeah. a, a regular printer, a, like a regular a computer printer, printer, regular printer prints out a, a one, uh, a two dimensional piece of paper yeah, right. and people are able to access that. Yeah. But certain printers have the ability to actually print out entire physical models of things and build the, build the actual thing as opposed to you having to go out and get that. So imagine, Imagine having that uh, that structure inside of your home, something that can print out physical objects. Well, I'm trying to imagine. It's a little hard because yeah. it's a little far out. It, but, it's, I it's, mean, it's going to, let's say, um, a clock. Mm -hmm. A clock is a complex thing. Mm -hmm. The printer is going and the to printer, create a clock the printer, or, the, or a design or mm -hmm. something that could be used to make a clock, yeah. but not make the clock itself. Yeah, absolutely. This, How that's, could they have to have the plastic and the mm -hmm. phosphorus and everything built the, into the machine? The, the, the printer prints out full working models of the of these of these objects a model I can and they're see. and they're and these and the, because of the accelerating um, tradi tra um, tradition of, t of technology yeah, yeah. is that the 3d printer is only going to advance itself it's only going to advance itself and the more and more these things Expert become more systems yeah, like, the yeah. more they become more populous throughout the environment where yeah. more people are having access to these things the less people are interacting with the market the more people are interacting with their own printers in their home and creating objects that they yeah, need but I yeah, now, now, wait a minute. Are you going to print a, a Ferrari? I mean, now, how, you know, I mean, how far can you go? Are you going to print that's, a, a Learjet? That's, I mean, what? That's I don't the, quite understand. That's the fascinating. I can't understand. That's the fascinating thing about 3D printing is that it's gotten to that point. There, there are 3D printers that print homes, that print cars, the, all the way the full working model. And, it, and it's that's super automation, super automation. But how can that be? I mean, so how, if we were no, be a little bit more practical. How mm -hmm. can you predict? How can you have a printer like the thing where we have a printer mm -hmm. turn out a uh, a car? Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd have to well, it's not. Of course, it's not going to be. Of course, it's no. not going to be like the little printer that you have inside of your home. What no. I'm saying, what I'm saying okay. is, if we are building technologies okay. that are removing people from the workplace, okay. they're, they're, that's they're very removing, important. Yeah. We're removing people from the workplace, so we no longer have people working on cars. We have people build, printing out their cars. So that printer out their, will be connected so to a factory that makes a car. Uh, and the and the design can be sent over mm -hmm. the printer, mm -hmm. and it can and be it can be kicked into rear, mm -hmm. and, and it can people, be robotized, and you don't have to have people to make the car. Mm -hmm. So people don't people don't need to.
be involved with the production process of creating a car. People don't have to be involved with anything more than the actual usage of the material. Why the 3D printer that you use as a model? Why the printer? The 3D Why not just say it's super cybernation where you can uh, have robotics uh, create cars? The 3D printer. Why is the printer? You have to send it from here to there. The 3D printer is just an example of how this becomes something that's accessible for you in your own home. That's just an example. Accessible that's just not in your own home. That's that's just an example of how automation technologies are slowly removing people from their own jobs and mm -hmm. also removing people from you having to access the, the market. I so if we're, there, if we're so. if people don't have the money to access jobs, I mean, if, they, if people don't have that money to access the market, but they're also losing their jobs. Well, we're having a we're having a fundamental clash here. We're having a clash. Well, that's another thing we're I dealing we're dealing we're dealing with the clash of how resource abundance is harming the marketplace. Resource abundance. When you talk about resource, um, okay, I know uh, John Maynard Keynes set up most of what is called the modern economy. Mm -hmm. You know, in the '30s, uh, out of the Depression, International Monetary Fund, the Bretton Woods, and that. And John Maynard Keynes set that up. And in 1930, uh, he wrote a letter to his grandchildren, mm -hmm. and he warned of something that was very hard for people to understand, because we had a, in the United States, we had a growth period coming up out of the Second World War that was phenomenal, middle class and all that. And he said, you're going to be confronted with something in their maturity, the generation, which would be about now, massive technologically induced unemployment. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he's the demand side person who mm -hmm. would get some demand, uh, and so forth in competition with, uh, you know, the supply siders and everything. And uh, if you have massive unemployment, it's a very real problem in a practical sense because the vast majority of the capital formation is done by the people who have the past savings. Mm -hmm. It gets more concentrated. Again, back to that business model. They make an investment in the future that's going to pay for itself out of its future earnings. So mm -hmm. they're tacked into the future. That's the thing. But that ability to have that is limited to a small, tiny 1% of the population is getting overwhelmingly wealthy mm -hmm. because the technology is what's creating the wealth. That's robotics and so mm -hmm. forth. And so the people are going to be displaced and they're not going to be able to have the money to clear the market. So mm -hmm. that demand question is not there. Mm -hmm. So you have to have an alternate way to get demand in buying power, money into yeah. the hands of the people if they're not going to be needed as wage earners or even you could use their loaded term wage slaves. Mm -hmm. That's a larger issue brought mm -hmm. up and that's the large issues confronting us all. Yeah. How are we going to get money into the hands? We got a pr present problem with the, de you know, the debt ceiling and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff mm -hmm. because we don't have a system that can get demand into the hands of the people other than a wage earner who gets paid for their labor mm -hmm. and celebrates the, uh, the labor input to production which is being displaced by our technological advancement into this world of surfeit for mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of a comp that's and a big a, that's a big policy issue confronting yeah. the world leadership. Mm -hmm. And, and that, the world. And those and, and that con that distinction, that mm -hmm. that exact distinction mm -hmm. is also coupled with an ecological crisis. Absolutely. These yeah. things are that, so so it's simultaneous crises that are happening all yeah. across. And then there's and then there's also the 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 one that most least talked about, but the, probably the most important one, which is the value crisis that we're dealing value. with. Value. We're dealing with hum, we're dealing with human values that that are accelerating the consumption. We we find a we find a uh, we find a sense of ourself yeah. in the consumption that we do. We find and we find other people thriving to get to that level of consumption, yeah. which accelerates the crises in the ecological environments, which accelerates the crises in the financial is that, environments. Is that part of a greed on the part, or part of well, status seeking? Or? There's 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 levels of yeah. causality that involves, yeah. but I think that it really comes down to this awareness problem. If people become aware of the crises. Most people don't even know aware of these things. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not in their everyday environments. We're not seeing, we're, they're, they're not interacting with these things. Their television shows, they don't talk about these things. Their um, yeah. policy leaders, they don't bring these things up. Yeah. They mostly encourage people to be, be, behave in their day-to-day -day, their day -to -day environment. People are accustomed to things. And yeah. they, you know, habits get formed mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah, right. So yeah. if so that's what was so phenomenal about this film, like I said, Dendo, yeah. but as being a frame shaker, mm -hmm. it changes, it changed, excuse me, my way of 
of looking at the way that I behave in the side of the world right. and looking at the way that other people behave, looking at the group behaviors of people and get away from this thing where I blame a politician for not, but start to realize that there is a underlying value problem. When the two, two major value problems that are, that are described in the film, it's, um, it's this problem of not recognizing the symbiosis that we have in our, uh, within, uh, within ourselves and with the environment and with, in, and with each other, yeah. right? If you don't understand that, that your integrity is really only as important, is really only secu as secure as the integrity as every other person on the planet and only as secure as every other thing on the planet. The yeah. actual planet itself yeah. ensures your integrity. If you don't re recognize that, then you're going to have big problems. If, the, if, if, if And not just you. It's not if you don't recognize that, but if your environment doesn't recognize yeah, right, that. Right, right, right. And, if, and if, the, if the behaviors you do, they don't, re if, if the behaviors you do are re reinforcing, yeah. reinforcing that you don't have to concern yourself yeah, with that. Yeah, right, right. As right? we would come out of history. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So all of these economic structures reinforce scarcity. Uh -huh. So people behave as if they live in a scarce world because everything around them informs their belief in well that. all right yeah but and also all of human history does that because really in a very real sense particularly if you're talking about how do you define like we said before how do you find haveness and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and you're coming into a, a kind of situation because throughout all of history there's never been enough mm -hmm. it's always been a matter of, if i win you have to lose mm -hmm. I can conquer you and then I can win, you lose, mm -hmm. and you know, and the real, it's the basis of politics, mm -hmm. which is whoever's got the power, mm -hmm. or the gun, or the machine gun, or the Gatling gun, or the cannon, or the tank, or the atomic bomb, can rule over the other. Mm -hmm. Real politique holds in terms of the politics because there's not nearly enough to there to be enough is the most qualitative transformation possible to imagine in terms of uh, the emer emerging situation. Are the people in the zeitgeist very wrapped up with the idea of Gaia, James Lovelock, that sees mm -hmm. the human, the, uh, the, the whole of human, the whole of uh, evolutionary process sort of as an organism? Mm -hmm. So like, I think if that's I may, a, one thing, that's I, in a human organism on the average is about 100 trillion cells. Most of them are in the gut. And so with bacteria, we all walk in a sea of bacteria, but in the human organism, about 100 trillion cells, each cell matters, and each cell is in communication with all the others as a system, part of systems training. So Gaia is, if you take the whole, with some of Rupert Sheldrake, and then you take the whole and see the whole organ as, it, as like an, you draw off and you see it like as an organism, you know? Like you see a human being, 100, 100, you don't see 100 individual cells, they all, co do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that there's a symbiosis, symbiosis between all of the cells that makes up a system. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, Hubert, I mean, uh, you know, James Lovelock in England and that, mm -hmm. is that come into some of the reading or the literature that's involved with the people in the zeitgeist or not? Or so would it? Nothing. That's also like synergy in a sense mm -hmm. that Fuller brought famously to the four. So there's nothing directly in our literature that talks okay. about Gaia, but okay. I think that there are parallels. And I mm. think that and a, a big degree is this, that there's nothing in Dr. King's literature, for instance, that references the Zeitgeist movement. There's mm -hmm. nothing in yeah. uh, Gandhi's literature that references the Zeitgeist yeah. movement. But you can see the parallels between what they were talking about. There yeah. is a there is a civil rights imperative yeah. for understanding the ecology. These yeah. are the things that uh, yeah. and, and supporting the ecology. Mm -hmm. to understand, there is a civil rights imperative a perspective and understanding what it means to spontaneously uh, allow people to spontaneously cooperate right. and find ways that allow people to spontaneously cooperate. Right. There isn't any civil rights imperatives and understanding the 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 uh, the, the that. 100% of humanity needs to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And that if, 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 if just one person is not being taken care of, that's too much. Uh, that's where Dr. King says, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. There's an imperative to understand that there should not be a disadvantage of anyone. Mm -hmm. No one should be disadvantaged. Particularly since we have an unusually huge, uh, unique capability. Mm -hmm. The ontology or the reality was scarce. Yeah. I mean, when we came out of the cave, all the recent, all the oil was here, everything was here, but we had a, le a, le a technological layout on of being able to use the resources, mm -hmm. some, uh, you know, eco ecological and uh, evolutionary advantage. Mm -hmm. The 200,000 years it took us to do it, mm -hmm. you know, but all the resources were here. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, and that uh, there's something new yeah. that's uh, culminating in mm -hmm. like a, uh, in, in, in evolution, you have uh, a system steady state and then there comes a punctuated equilibrium. It's like a, 
a quickening in a pregnancy and then the new appears. Mm -hmm. And we got all the variety of species and so forth. And uh, I can't help thinking it's, uh, there's a th movement coming, I don't know if you heard or got in touch, transhumanism. Mm. People are beginning to think in terms of trans homo sapien, mm. relationships in universe mm. that might be the result of some liberated order of a maximally engaged humanity that would re result in some synergistic resonance in universe that would be transcendent to what we've been throughout 200,000 years of our sojourn on Earth. We're mm. that, anyway. I'm off on a track that maybe I shouldn't be. But I think we're at a time of qualitative transformation, mm -hmm. yeah. So spell out some more. So the Gaia is not directly involved. Resource-based economy, that's important to both um, uh, the Zeitgeist and the and, and so The forth. Venus Project, yeah. Yeah, and the Venus Project, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're writing the book, you think you might have it done by the end of the year, and also you think that this, uh, this, uh, this movement is growing, mm -hmm. and it links up with Buckminster Fuller, Buckminster Fuller Institute carrying on his. What other people from history or systems thinker, uh, comprehensive thinkers, particularly like say in economics, is there found within the zeitgeist camaraderie of the people that make it up? Um, Who do they like? Do they like Keynes? Do they like any of the economists that we talked to? Uh, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge distinction that the Zeitgeist Movement makes when we talk about resource-based economy. Mm -hmm. uh, resource-based economy is a non-monetary economy. It's a futurist perspective to, to some degree, but it's a system that does not operate with money at all. Okay, now, well, that's pretty odd. Yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. um, as a result of that, it makes... It, it puts a it puts a distinction between all monetary economists. Yeah. So that puts a distinct. So the 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 perspective that Henry George had, Thorstein Veblen had, um, uh, Hefe Hayek, all of all of them, and then we have this whole this other school of thought of how do you operate an economy without money, and that's a much well. That's a whole different thing. How are mm -hmm. you going to do an economy without money, particularly in the transition phase? Um, it seems to me if there's any one thing, if you're just thinking in general terms about the world, society, and everything, what is it that holds society together now, a institutionally and so forth, in terms of society, I guess around the world and everything, it seems to me the most important thing and most, most forced or otherwise, or by choice, the most important thing, the most important value that has meaning in terms of holding society together now is money. Mm. Everything is based on money. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to get their job. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to get a job in order to get food. And that either because you can't get it, you don't have means of buying the needs you have. But money is the most important thing in the consciousness mm -hmm. of most people now. Mm -hmm. And now you're saying you're going to have an economy where you don't have to have any concern with money. Mm -hmm. That's a big jump, is yeah, it not? Yeah, it's a huge jump. How? And, the and thing how is do they deal with the insta Like Mr. Obama is going to come now. They're going to debt ceiling thing. All these issues that are so at the center of the news and mm -hmm. the center of the political and economic establishment mm -hmm. that runs the world by and large, the Congress and everything, how are you going to um, deal with the questions that are, ro are of concern to them, mm -hmm. which has to get into economic theory? Mm -hmm. Keynes, Schumpeter, and you know, the whole, the whole business, of, and you got all the things coming from the Republicans and so forth, having different issues. It's all revolving around ultimately money. Mm -hmm and credit and the way the system's going to be structured. Mm -hmm. Well, well how, uh, okay, so how do they deal with the established order? So there's a couple things, there's a couple things that are important to talk about when we're talking about how to deal, how to at least think about a resource-based economy. First thing is you can't think of about a resource-based economy in terms of tomorrow. So, uh, so, so, so okay. this isn't this isn't something that's necessarily okay, going good. to be. Okay, long so, term. so it's 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 that's that's the one of the major problems when we're uh, dealing with investment class thinking right, right. or when we're dealing with investment the, class thinking. Yeah, okay, yeah. is that we're, when we're de when we deal with investment class thinking, we're only talking about what is the next cycle? So either whether we're talking about the next election cycle or we're talking about the next quarterly earning uh -huh. cycle, that's that's not long-term thinking. That's yeah, not no, systems not at thinking all. at all. No. But when we're talking about resource-based economy, we have to project that forward. We have to recognize uh -huh. that there are institutions that are barriers to that type of that type of learning, that type of perspective. Yeah, right, right. But one Futures. of the fun, one Futures. of the one of fundamental perspectives on this, yeah. the the. Er, the First thing that you have to understand is first this distinction about scarcity. Yeah. This 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 thing that we've been discussing for uh -huh. the last hour or so, yeah. uh, less um, well, not hours so, yeah, yeah, but it's a huge issue. Yeah. If people first come to that recognition, mm -hmm. which is what all economic systems I have been right have been way. built up, yeah. all economic systems. It's Marx, a foundational principle. Yeah, yeah. all Marx, 
Thorstein, mm. all, every person, yeah. every economic thinker has been dealing with the, the intellectual genealogy that goes back to Adam Smith and the early yeah, economic right. thinkers, that go back to um, John Locke even. Yeah, natural sort of, law, yeah. It, all of these things coming out of that, uh, all of these scarce time periods, yeah. right? But there are, the, but that's just a certain part of human history. That's yeah. not all of human history when no, we're no. talking about where economic thinking comes from. So there are other people who have thought about how do we deal with resources in a way that doesn't operate with money. There's South Pacific, yeah. South Pacific um, societies that didn't deal with money. Yeah. And that's what I, I talked about earlier, agrarian yeah. wave societies that were resource-based economies where people contributed to a global commons. I guess there were places access. that didn't have... Uh, have money. Yeah. They had ways of exchange. Exactly. Or they could trade. So. Now there. Now some of, some of these things were deal, still dealing in the in the problem of scarcity. So yeah. instead of dealing with money, they were trading in, in individual resources. Yeah. But there were also common areas yeah. where people were able to used, access yeah. their access goods. Before um, the enclosure movement in yeah, England. Yeah, yeah. That was horrible. Yeah. So then you have people like Charles Eisenstein right now who are talking about gift economies. How do we remove? How do we move the capitalist structure into a gift a gift economic structure, yeah. which is a sort of a transition phase so we get into this point of non-money now again you cannot think about this thing in there in terms of tomorrow when you yeah. think about it in terms of tomorrow of course the, the ramifications happen but because uh, we have to lay us on mm -hmm. but we do have to lay us on with the historically inherited institutions yeah. and, we, and, and the people who represent yeah. them and have them subsumed within this new mm -hmm. way and that's so why need something that includes everyone mm -hmm. without a, a, benef a disadvantage anyway and that's where the policy that's work a, comes that's in. the ultimate and that's challenge. where i hope to see members of the zeitgeist movement really stepping in stepping into roles where now now that you have the awareness now that you understand what the reality of the world is what the capabilities that the world have then we start to interact with decision makers and push them forward to start thinking about different ways of interacting with the policy interacting with the reality of the uh, of the reality of the environment so not removing yourself from yeah. the political structures of, right. the, of the world not removing yourself from the economic structures yeah. of the world but finding opportunities which is what buck mr fuller said yeah. being a trim tab yeah. how do you yeah, stick that. yourself let's, let's how do you stick that. yourself yeah. into mm. a place uh -huh. where just by you being inside there you can push the economic structure in in such a way yeah. that your presence there just your very presence there creates change. And I think that's what people like Maury Strong did and what Groham Brundtland did and other people who were involved with the sustainable development uh -huh. movement. They put themselves into places uh -huh. where just their very presence there, mm -hmm. they were able to forge common um, common understandings and bridge build. That's what people like Martin Luther King did, where by, by being there, by being a symbol, being a person who questioned, who asked the who asked the strong questions to decision makers. That's why we remember him so much. We, yeah. he, he spoke to, we yeah. have plenty of pictures of him in the White House, mm -hmm. hanging out with Lyndon Johnson, mm -hmm. pushing him to make those make those strong understandings about the way that the world And there was operates. a movement yeah. that was blown in the wind that gave a lot of force to the mm -hmm. sales that were pushing that forward. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like that. The trim tab is a very interesting idea because mm -hmm. I'm not sure people know that. Uh, he, that was the term he, he, he said. I think on his tombstone, yeah. call me trim tab. Yeah. I think it is. Mm -hmm. Trim tab is on a big ocean liner. When you're moving a big ocean liner, let's say the world economy yeah. or something like that through the air, they has a big rudder at the back that is what turns the ship. Mm -hmm. But in order to get it started, that process, Says, there's a little tiny rudder mm -hmm. that's called trim tab on the ship uh, that is turned in a certain way that begins the process of moving the big rudder. Yeah. And so a trim tab would be like a futurist orientation mm -hmm. or linking to that. And a future orientation is the lot. An investment banker has to have a future orientation if they're considering an investment. Mm -hmm. You want to invest in something that's going to pay logic of business finance, logic of ecological finance, mm -hmm. logic of political finance, is you want to have an investment that's going to pay for itself, benefit, out of its future earnings, mm -hmm. okay? So that you can tap into the future earnings. You get that before? Mm -hmm. That's Kelso. Mm -hmm. And that's limited to so few because nobody has the collateral mm -hmm. to put up. Mm -hmm. So, but you have to get that, you have to have a way of forming the capital that's gonna make the technological thing possible. Henry Ford built River Rouge yeah. and so forth. You have to have investment and you have to have that investment distributed out among the people in general to bring them in on the logic of uh, investment philosophy is you you're going to make you're tapping into the future. That's what we need because that's a bridge between the pre the past and the future and the zeitgeist and so forth. Not resource economy is a future thing mm -hmm. that you have to have, and you have to have something that can involve everybody. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a way in which the uh, the, the population in general 
is going to be able to be having buying power in terms of the investment. So, so it's a real challenging time. Mm -hmm. When you say it's not tomorrow, does that mean it's not for another thousand years? I don't or when would it be? Are we dreaming about something that could be or can be? Or is it going to be in, the, 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 the anchor of history is very, very heavy. Mm -hmm. and, and the inclination for people to associate with institutions in place and get their, ide their identities will be wrapped up in, pro in roles they have within a context that's being qualitatively changed in terms of a future emerging. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? All of that is part of the big challenge, is yeah. it not? Yeah. yeah. I think that, um, and I'm not, I'm not a prophet. I'm not here to say. You're not a yeah. prophet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to say, you know, when or how or who or what's going to happen. But I, what I do honestly believe, I don't, I, I don't believe that change is going to happen amongst the decision makers at the top. I don't think it's going to happen amongst the power elite. I don't think that's where it's going to happen. You don't think they have to be involved? I think, of course, they have to be involved. Okay. But I don't think that's where change is going to happen. It's going to come that, among, I, is it a youth thing? I, I, I'm, you I'm, think I'm the youth have an advantage? Or, let me, go ahead. Let me, this point. So I don't we think, have about three minutes. Okay. Left. So I don't think this. I don't think um, change is going to happen with decision makers. And one of the major reasons why I don't think so is because their goals and ambitions are wrapped up into the structure that exists right now. So yeah, what they're, they're trying to... they're also going to have to be brought in at absolutely. some point. Well, I don't, I'm not discounting okay. that. I'm not discounting their mm -hmm. participation. Yeah. What I'm saying is I don't think I, their goals and their ambitions are wrapped up in the existing structure. So right, now, and right now... You know the term reifying? Absolutely. Reestablishing outdated institutions of which the identities of most of the people are wrapped up. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. So it's identity mm -hmm. that is also important. So that's important. what I mean is that yeah. these things are... these they're instit their, the institutions support support their goals and ambitions, so they're trying. To, so that doesn't mean that they're negative people, that they're horrible yeah, right. people. It just means that what they're trying to accomplish, either, whether whether or not they're trying to accomplish these things in the in the global in their in their in their in, in their in own environments, or whether or not they're trying to accomplish these things on a global and scale, also be they're practical. wrapped up there. Now, and I also don't think that change is necessarily going to come in the lower two billion people who are starving to death on this planet. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen there because these people actually have to do on their day to day basis try yeah. to figure out ways yeah, to eat. I don't think that it's going to happen within the 200 million people who are rich and, and, and don't have to deal with the pressures of these things. I think it's going to come amongst this group of people who are having a growing awareness, who are becoming increasingly concerned about the environment, who are increasingly informed of the ecology, increasingly concerned about our economic systems, and are becoming aware, who have the awareness of this, but also they have the choice to decide whether or not they're going to go and decide to be a rich person or if they're going to decide, if, and, and by rich person I mean just moderately rich, I mean, uh, uh, I mean somebody who's focused primarily on capital, or if people are going to decide to make the choice and to be an activist or be a, whether an, an activist in whatever measure, whether you're going to be an activist in academia, whether you're going to be an activist out, out speaking, but to bring this information about what the reality of the world is and hopefully be able to bring that change. And, and then incorporate the decision makers so that we can help the two billion people who are starving to death on this planet yeah. and also be able to, to change the minds of the people who are so indoctrinated in their own ways that they yeah. don't really see the difference. Well, it's a big challenge of foragers all. It's educational, it's across the boards, it's political, and it's going to be carried by a whole lot of different kind of people. Mm -hmm. I would like to put in a little small punch for this thing, or a little, little plug for this thing called public access cable television, yeah. which has a unique financing capability to bring <laughs> production capability to the masses of the people. We got 3,000 of them across the United States. We got Manhattan Neighborhood Network and all the good people that are here. And that's a place where a lot of the media could be developed. And then the media is, is part of an educational process that could be uh, informing even the educational institutions themselves that I think are out of date coming from that environment. Mm -hmm. So it calls for a lot of challenge, but in anything, one of the people who might be in the van of doing that would be a guy named uh, uh, Bakari uh, Page, <laughs> who has been our guest. Mm -hmm. Bakari, thanks a lot for coming in. Yeah. Uh, all the best. I know you got a lot of uh, things lined up where you're trying and to do. Thank academic. you for championing this. So this is really like it's very. I'm very happy that you continue championing a lot of the stuff that you've been doing. Well, I'm trying like, to keep I've, up with you guys. I yeah. looked into a lot of your work over the past couple years well, uh, past had, decades actually yeah I'm yeah really about 45 years or so okay your pleasure to have his perceptions we invite you to tune in thank uh, next time we'll be coming back again but uh, let's by all means stay in touch we'll be in touch with one another and thank you for viewing we're coming back tomorrow thank you